Hi everyone, and welcome to my review of Season 3 of Afterlife. Uh, let's just cut to the chase. Once again, I didn't really like it. I've been a fan of most of Ricky Gervais's previous TV work, uh, not Derek, obviously, but I really can't stand this show. I was really debating whether to bother doing this video, because I thought, what's the point? Season 3 is not dissimilar to Season 2 or 1. In fact, they are very, very similar. I thought, what's the point in doing another video where I'm going to talk about the same thing again? I'll have the same criticisms. But I did actually get quite a few messages asking for a season three review, which kind of blew my mind because, as I said in my other videos, I literally thought these videos would get about two views. So cheers for them. So what I thought I would do is run through my points from season two and see if they appear in this season. And also, I will add some criticisms and talk about some of the more insane elements of the show with some closing thoughts of the show as a whole. If anyone cares. No? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. She was one hell of a woman, sexually. I said in my season two review that all characters are completely one dimensional and that still feels the case. Characters have one quirk that defines them and, and that's it. There are no other discernible features. This also applies to the new characters introduced. One character in particular that annoyed me is the new guy in the care home, aka Tony's dad's replacement. I just thought, well, what's the point? He's the exact same, so uh, is it just to get some easy laughs out of a man that suffers from memory loss? It's a, a really bizarre choice for a character. Some people think that, that oh, oh, you know, they, they describe it as like uh, an ensemble cast of of strange losers and misfits. And I think, no, that's what that's what England's like. Because, <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they're used to watching ER when everyone looks like George Clooney and Brad Pitt. And I go, no, 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 no. Most people look like me and Brian Gittins. <laughs> we don't look like Johnny Depp. That's normal. <laughs> I don't think that is the criticism. No one cares about their looks, it's about their personalities. They are all losers and misfits. And I would say most people in Britain are relatively normal in terms of personality. They, they certainly aren't all like this. Uh, this is Colleen, uh, the new intern. She's Sandy's replacement, Tony. You all right? No, not really. Here we go! Hello, you fucking shit! You dickheads! We're here with the family at the Tambury Gazette. Bang, bang! I'm a taxi driver! I drive through the night, picking up who I like. Bang, bang, I'm a taxi driver. Be knowledgeable about your job. If your heart's not in it, maybe you shouldn't be here. I'm on minimum wage, mate. Work harder at school, mate. Testing, testing, testing my testing testicles. One, two, three, testing my, my testicles. testicles all over. Oh, my God, they're so full. <laughs> oh, whoops. Have you got Parkinson's? Crack, 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 right in her fucking movie. She was like, oh, thanks, oh, darling, I've needed oh, that. Oh, God, in my eye, I've got you know, what you been eating? Don't worry about that, Nana. You I mean, if you had a show where all the characters were completely normal, then obviously it would be pretty boring. But these characters are so exaggerated that it's really difficult to take them seriously. And it really sort of muddies the water between whether this is a comedy or whether this is something that's meant to be taken seriously because it tries to be both and i think in doing so it really struggles with identity look we all have our foibles but they don't define us as people take for example jay from the inbetweeners we know him mostly for his constant exaggerations and wildly unbelievable stories but that isn't all there is to him and even in a show like the inbetweeners we get insight into why jay is like how he is because of the relationship with his dad. And the reason I make this comparison is because The Inbetweeners isn't a show that is meant to be focusing on any sort of serious topics like grief or mental health. It's a comedy aimed mostly at GCSE students and sixth formers, but it still has better written characters than Afterlife does. Let's look close at home at Ricky's previous work, The Office, and let's look at Tim. He starts off as a guy who's quite laid back, but you can tell he's aware of his situation and he realises that it isn't going to go anywhere. Then when he reaches his 30th birthday in episode 3, you see him gradually start to come to terms with his situation 
and he starts thinking more seriously about how to change it. During a pointless and largely bureaucratic training day, he breaks. In his moment of madness, he asks out Dawn, as he wasn't yet aware that herself and Lee had got back together, so he is met with rejection. He decides after this that he wants to quit anyway and study psychology, and a few days after there is awkwardness between Tim and Dawn. It's in this time that he realises that he can't leave. Although the show never explicitly says this, you can pretty much pinpoint the moment he has this re-evaluation. It's because he can't leave Dawn, and David offering Tim the position of senior sales clerk at the end of season one allows him to make that decision. After this, you can see a clear change in Tim's character. I think part of him slightly resents Dawn for making him choose to stay, so he tries to act professional, and he tries to distance himself from her. But then again in doing so, he realises how that affects her, and the guilt gets the better of him. A new character is introduced during the merger who takes a liking to Tim. This is where you see Dawn's attitude towards Tim change. Perhaps the sudden thought of unavailability for the backup option, but it's also her losing a friend. It's also in this episode Dawn starts to realise she isn't exactly happy with her situation either, accelerating her decision to move to America. Tim and Rachel start to become more serious when Rachel tells Tim that she has agreed for her and Tim to meet her parents. This commitment scares Tim, and his love for Dawn is becoming more evident. He decides to break up with Rachel, only to find out Dawn is leaving to live in Florida, prompting him to ask her out again, to which he is once again met with rejection. And this is how series two finishes. It's not until a year later in the Christmas specials we get a resolution. And, well, we all know how that ends. Now, that was quite a long summary, but that was about the shortest I could make it, because the characters go through an arc, there is a change in their circumstances which therefore affects their thoughts, feelings, actions, and how they interact with one another. Crashing back down to afterlife, what's the difference between, say, Lenny in season one to Lenny at the end of season three, or the postman from season one to season three, or Matt, or Sandy, or Roxy? But, oh no, wait, sorry, those, those characters just disappear and are explained away in barely one line of dialogue. And also, I get that these characters, their circumstances change in the show, but they never seem to grow. There's no progression because the characters were caricatures in the first place. And look, I know the show focuses on Tony, but does Tony really change? At the end of the final episode, there's a part where Tony claims he realises that kindness is a superpower. I thought not caring was a superpower. I was wrong. Caring about stuff. That's what really matters. Kindness, making other people feel good. But he says almost the exact same thing at the end of season one. At first I thought it was like a, like a superpower. You can't not care about things you actually care about. It's worth sticking around to maybe Make my little corner of the world a slightly better place. What, does he forget in that time? Or is it just more likely the fact that this show was only meant to be one season? And you can tell that as you watch it, there is never any long-term payoff for characters because Ricky wrote scripts that wrapped up the story at the end of each season. The decision to recommission was based on the popularity of the show. So how are you ever meant to plan for the long term? And Kaf's character is absolutely all over the place in this season. Initially, she's introduced as a straw man woman so that Tony, Ricky, could win arguments against her. And then Ricky tried to write her into the plot a bit by saying she has a thing for Matt, but that sort of falls flat and nothing ever comes of it. And then at the end of season two, she pairs off with this bloke. And then at the beginning of the season, she's just cruelly mean to him for absolutely no reason. What's in it for you, Colin? People think he's got a girlfriend. But he knows that can never be the case. Shame. What with the Rolls Royce and him being a self-made millionaire in a nice block? Would have been perfect. Not for the obvious. What? The face! Duh! And then, bizarrely, for the rest of the season, we see her try to find a boyfriend. And we're meant to feel sorry for her when it doesn't work out. <laughs> Despite us knowing how badly she treated this poor guy. Well, what? Sometimes in this show it feels like Ricky has an idea for a joke and then couldn't find a way to get it in naturally so just chucks in regardless of whether 
it's consistent with the character or not. I, I don't, sorry, I don't believe in all that, but, but thank you. I have to admit, this was toned down a bit from season two, but it still happens. He still makes fun of Christians. Right, you say God, but what do you think God is exactly? Fat people. You don't work? No, I took early retirement to get disability benefits. Oh, um, if you don't mind me asking, what, um, what's wrong with you? Well, look at me. I'm absolutely fucked. And ghosts, spirits. You don't believe in all that nonsense, do you? What? The supernatural, mediums, fortune tellers. Again, I will admit, it's slightly more reserved this season. The scenes don't go on for as long as before, but it's still all stuff we've seen a million times before. I showed in my season two review these topics cropping up in almost all his previous work, so I won't show you again, but the fact is, it is still there. I used to sit on this bench every day by myself, hoping that someone would come along who would understand. She's still here, and still here. She remains a figure of mystery. This time you at least get to hear a bit about her and her relationship with her husband in this season. And there are also times where she isn't sitting on the bench. So that's some character progression right there. I think the intention of this character is that she's meant to sort of be a voice of reason. Someone who's there when the therapist wasn't. But everything she says to me always comes across as being so shallow. Oh, and there are angels, by the way. They don't have wings and live in clouds. They wear nurses' uniforms and work hard to pay the rent on their houses. Some work for charities because they can't look the other way. Some have four legs and bark. <laughs> it's like her lines of dialogue were ripped straight from www.famousquotes.com. So what's that uh, Mark Twain quotation? I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which have never happened. Nothing she says feels natural to me. Always something that has been shoehorned in. It's like Ricky Gervais saw a good quote before. Oh, I must put that in. A society grows great when old men plant trees, the shade of which they know they will never sit in. It's, yeah, very nice. You're quite a philosopher. Well, it's just that I think our, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Are you reading these? Am I what? Reading the quotes, sort of. What doesn't... Right. Confucius. Well, Bernard, Just my who said them first, oh. I am passing on my wisdom cool. to you. And don't tell those I've just been... Oh, my goodness. ...reading it. It's in, an insert. I'll put it down there if it's obvious. Well, I'm not saying... Playing previously about the scenes with a the therapist and I said that they weren't funny and relied solely on gross out humour. Now the therapist doesn't feature in this series which I'm sure is a creative choice and not just because he got a better gig elsewhere but everything the therapist would have said is basically said by other characters now. They say something horrific or graphic and the other character sits there uncomfortably. Still together then? On and off, yeah. She was shagging spudded for a while. You caught, is that it, didn't you? Awkward. Oh, really? Do you live with your alcoholic mum because your dad's in prison for beating up her brother who groped you? If someone doesn't want full-on intercourse, that is fine. It's like old Mrs. Polden, yeah? She just likes Jeff to stroke you. <laughs> she loves it. Mm. Up to her. I have lived a life, boy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, roller coaster. She was one hell of a woman, sexually. Why did the chicken cross the road? Don't know. To get away from the smell of two gypsies fucking my wife. Mystery, 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 mystery. Boring. Turn around. Let me see that ass. <laughs> All of that. Scrabble round. Get your mouth. Around my naughty lolly. You need to know I'm not the stallion I once was, you know. I know I get the urge. I think all of us have a little bit of me time. I go upstairs, I close the curtains. Harry, the five-legged spider, he comes out to play. And after a couple of minutes, I think, nah, can't be bothered with this. I remember the slice of mature cheddar and crusty cob. I go downstairs, you know. So. And I'm not a humorless void. I get how this can be funny. But how can you laugh at this when you've seen this exact same joke format a hundred times throughout the show? There are far too many of these scenes, 
And I think they are lazy, to be honest. It's easier to write something like that rather than actual story progression or meaningful dialogue. And this point ties nicely into... I gave the character a dog, so I'd have a dog for um, the shoot. So I love working with uh, the dog. Um... This is still the case. Episodes begin and end with no through line. It very much still revolves around Tony's dead wife. There are just as many recordings of her on her deathbed and flashbacks as previous seasons. And they're all so sickly. I get that they loved each other, but are you seriously telling me that their relationship was literally perfect? You keep seeing wee like flashbacks and videos that he's watching his um uh, his uh dead wife, because that's kind of what it's about. And she's always smiling and I've always had such a good time and she's always smiling and she was always such a laugh and always had such a fucking laugh and always had such a fucking laugh and she's always smiling and she's always like, oh, you gave me a fright there with that water. Oh, you. Again and again and again and again. I would have loved to see a flashback where one of them reacts badly to something or if they have some sort of disagreement. And then at least it would provide Tony with a bit more self-reflection rather than just constantly looking back on their perfect relationship and being sad. It's one-dimensional. And then at the end of the episode, you could have shown how they made up to one another. You know, whether one of them apologised or if, if they both have apologised or... Uh, just, it would just add something to how we understand the relationship rather than showing this constant memories of how amazing they were together. It's me again. Oh, good. Running out of things to say, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Found a poem. No. It says, No. What I want to say. Oh, God, please, no. Do not stand at oh, my grave and weep. Yeah. I yeah. am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn's rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift, uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft star shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. The word cunt is still overused and bizarrely used to some sort of in-joke punchline, like just saying the word itself is meant to be somehow inherently funny. There are recycled bits which have not only been recycled in Ricky's other work, but also in previous seasons. There are also parts which feel similar to other shows Ricky has done. Although it's not exactly the same, it's, it's enough to make you think, haven't you already done this? Like the bit in extras when Maggie is being shown a terrible flat, reminding me of a similar scene in Afterlife. Where's the bedroom? I know, it's all in here. Well, this is it. Tiny little kitchen over here. And there's the lavatory. It's, it's everything you need. You'd never have to leave this place. So we, we've got the dining space, living room area, so kitchen, bedroom. Very convenient to each other. <laughs> well, this is the only place in your price range, really, so... What's the area like, then? Well, this is the size you're looking at for the rent you want to pay, and, and this is quite a cheap area too, so it's a bit bigger than you get anywhere else. <laughs> What's the area like? Also, this bit did make me laugh. What's the area like? Yeah, really rough, love. Really rough. It's the uh, the roughest part of this lovely village. How, how can we make this posh upper-class part of Hamel Hempstead look rough? Uh, just stick some bin bags and a homeless man there. There is a bit where this guy is talking about how he can win awards by being mental, which is really similar to a bit that Ricky has done in extras. What well, acting is pretending. What did you even say was wrong with me? Huh? Well, I didn't go into specifics, did I? This is every actor's dream. Look at Daniel Day-Lewis in my left foot. Fuck me, what was up with him? I don't know. No one cared. Rain Man, what was that little twat doing? It's not hard. Mm. Oh, that's worth remembering, I tell you. That is another way you win an Oscar. Seriously, think about it. Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot, Oscar. Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man, Oscar. John Mills, Ryan's Daughter, Oscar. Yeah. Seriously? You are guaranteed an Oscar if you play a mentor. And actually, now that I think about it, this, this whole side story with this little James Corden character, uh, actually I think he's called James in the show, he 
is this not just extras? No, he's a guy who wants to be taken as a serious actor but can't get any roles or or jobs because of his incompetent agent except this time his incompetent agent is basically instead of just being darren lamb it's now darren lamb and bunny mixed into one there was a bit in the last episode where ricky is saying he regrets being skeptical of the afterlife because she wanted to believe and he hopes she didn't feel scared which reminds me of the, the mother's death scene in the invention of lying Again, I know it's not exactly the same, but it feels so similar. And and not just that, but the whole thing is repetitive, the whole show. I, I genuinely, I don't know how you can write something like this and not realise how repetitive it actually is. How many more times can you write in an old clip about his dead wife? How many more videos did this goddamn woman record on her deathbed? How many more times can Tony visit the grave? How many more nutcases can Tony interview? My dad used to say life's like a rise at the fair. Exciting, scary, fast, and you can only go around once. My mum always said. There is also quite a surreal moment where Tony winds Matt up to the point that he has a heart attack, and then that's it. It just it just kind of happens, and then nothing comes from it. Like what? What? Why is that? What? Was this just because there hadn't been a suicide attempt in this season, so Ricky just needed to write something that he thought would have an impact? Did he need to fill five minutes in an episode? Just, what? You've got all the same stress and anger as me, but I shout at people and call them cunts and smash things up. You keep it all in. It's got to go somewhere. Good advice for anyone listening. Good advice. It's good writing. Also, just a couple of bits that annoyed me. They are a bit nitpicky, these ones, but I can't help it. They, they just took me out of it. And they are byproducts of bad writing. So here in episode four, Tony goes to the old people's home and talks to his dad's clone. And then afterwards, when the nurse appears, he says, I've got to go. And then she suggests, oh, I can take some time off and we can go for a walk. But surely the only reason he would have gone to the old people's home is to see the nurse. But then as soon as he gets there, he says, I've got to go. So why did he go in the first place? His dad's dead. Also, in the same episode, when Tony and Lenny are having a drink, Kath just randomly shows up after her date. It's Kath. Oh. How does she know they would be there? Isn't it weird just to pop into someone's home unannounced? Actually, at least I know why this one happens. It's so Ricky Gervais can get in this hilarious punchline. What was he like? Absolute cunt. I'm so proud of you. Brilliant. Such a funny word. This whole bit feels like a scene from Friends or something. Catherine. You alright? Yeah. How was it? Can't describe it. What were you like? An absolute cunt. I'm so proud of you. Again, this is still the case. Everything is shot really standard. Same light filter, the same backlighting. The ending is a bit different in terms of how it's shot, but more on that later. Um, but there was really no expense spared on the set design and locations. Everywhere does feel like a set, uh, including the cafes and the restaurants. Everything is totally devoid of character and charm. I mean, look at the Tambury Fair in the end. That's the big spectacle that this whole season has been leading to. And it's just totally empty. I've been to school fates busier than that. I'll cut them a bit of slack this season because this was shot during COVID time. So there probably was protocols they had to follow. But that doesn't excuse the previous seasons. Okay, a, f a few production editing nitpicks. In the first episode, uh, there is a car at this junction, and then it disappears in the next shot. Look, look I, I told you these were nitpicky. When Matt and Tony leave the pub, they must have parked their car in the only parking spot the pub has. Either for that, or they were just blocking the road. And in episode five, when Tony's playing squash, he is, he's sick here with his head against the wall. But then there is another shot of him being sick, but this time a couple of feet away from the wall. But then it cuts back to the original shot, and he's closer to the wall again. Nitpicky, I know, but 
when you edit this, how do you not realize? Or do they just think, oh, it's such a quick cut, no one will notice. Also, last one but here, Matt looks directly into the camera. Also in production, last time I did talk about makeup, but this time they no. I can't believe that the biggest laugh I got out of this season was these children with cancer. But look at their head, man. It's so bad. I pointed this out in season two as well with Lisa, but it somehow looks even worse on these kids. Oh, and by the way, if you laughed and then felt guilty and thought, oh, I shouldn't laugh in case they do. They don't. Don't worry, I looked it up. I mean, they look like Brian Cranston in El Camino. Also, this whole cancer bit with the children, it, it just seems really cheap. And when the kid said her name was Lisa, not only had I already called it, but my eyes rolled so far back into my head that I saw my brain deflate with a sigh of despair. This whole bit seems emotionally exploitative. Why'd you ask? You're funny. Am I? I'll tell you what, Tony is such a bloody good bloke. You're my angel, Tony. This is my biggest, most prevalent problem throughout season three. I just can't buy into their narrative that Tony is a good person. I've seen very little throughout the show to prove this. Despite what the other characters say about him, Tony seems to go around doing and saying whatever he likes whilst receiving no repercussions and then actually being told that he's a good person. I do like it. I'm just right. saying that's how good an artist she was. It's not one of her best. I wasn't... Right. Don't, please don't be like this, OK? Oh, I think I'm going to go. OK. Um, um, am I coming with you? No. no. It's OK to admit that you're a nice bloke, you know, Tony. It's not a weakness. Right. You're my angel, Tony. <sighs> ah! You stupid bastard! That bit went in my mouth! Good. I hope that was his cock, you stupid cunt. <sighs> oh, good. I couldn't stand to lose another wonderful man. Love you, keen word. <gasps> There's no honour anymore. Have you done a boo? Big farmyard boo? Oh, for fuck's <laughs> sake. You OK? Yeah, why? And you're good, Tony. You have so much to give. Smart, funny, lovely. It's not funny, actually. That oh, wow. I disagree. Tony, can you clear this up, please? No. Okay, I've I've got to go over some of these clips because uh, some of them... I, I mean, this first one is actually insane. So, someone doesn't stop for him at a zebra crossing, which I admit you are meant to do, but Tony's reaction is not justified at all. What he does is an arrestable offence. I mean, it's criminal damage or vandalism, I'm not sure which, but it's illegal. And it's played out here like it's a cool thing to do. And the, the way he just walks off and the bloke just doesn't do anything. He doesn't shout like, uh, what the fuck are you doing, mate? Or why the hell did you do that? He just stands there and then retreats into his vehicle. Obviously, you know, intimidated by Tony's prowess. You know, in order for this one to work, he had to write in being a, a man on his own that steps out of this car. Because if it was anyone else, it wouldn't work. Imagine imagine if it was a woman that got out and said, excuse me, why did you just do that? You almost just killed my children, you fucking psychopath. It's just crazy to me that such mental actions are treated with such little reverence or consequence. It's not the first time something like this has happened. In season one, he literally kills a man, and then nothing. No repercussions, nothing. Similar to this, let's talk about the pub scene, because in this scene where he's scattering his dad's ashes on the floor, the initial reaction of the landlord is totally justified. If I owned a pub, and a guy started sprinkling ashes of his dead relative on the floor, I would be pretty annoyed. And, and sorry, what is Tony's excuse exactly? Okay, there's no harm. I know they get cleared away. Oh, I, I knew you were going to clean it anyway. That's, that's not an excuse. Oh, oh, you knew they were going to clean it anyway. I'll take a shit on the floor then. Why not take a shit on the floor? Yeah, if someone told me that they wanted their ashes spread at a pub in the country, I'm pretty sure I would do it in the beer garden outside. Not, not on the fucking floor. And something that Ricky Trace has done in this scenario is he has made the landlord overreact in order to make Tony look like the good guy. By making the landlord say things like it's vandalism and 
what about diseases? It, it makes a landlord irrational. So you have to side with Tony, but Tony is also in the wrong. I hope that was his cock, you stupid cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just in case you didn't get the joke, it's it, it's subtle, I know, but the the joke here is that you call him a cunt. It's it's very original. There's no honour anymore. You done a boo, big farmyard boo. Oh, for fuck's <laughs> sake! You okay? Oh, good. Another scene where Ricky Gervais gets annoyed at someone in a restaurant or cafe. I mean, in this scenario, this this guy's just talking to his kid. I mean, he's not even being particularly loud. And and look, I get it. It's annoying when people do baby talk, but. Just deal with it. We we know you have a hatred of people making noise. That's that has been made plenty clear, not only from this show, but all his other stuff. And I, I made a small montage of these moments in my season two review, so I won't show all the examples again. But it's another one of those scenarios where the person Tony is arguing with is totally justifying their argument. But it's played off as if Tony's the one in the right. You know, there were moments in this show where I thought that Ricky Gervais had reached the lowest he has ever stooped for a laugh. But what follows really takes the cake, and I'm just going to play in its embarrassing entirety to emphasise that. Who's a noisy prick? You are. You're a big annoying prick. Well, that's pathetic. Sorry, I'm just talking to my friend. Well, you're yeah. saying things that others don't want to hear. So are you, but you don't care. So, uh, yeah, you're a big loud cock. Yes, you are. You're a hipster gnome looking fucking twat. You big, annoying, loud cock in public. You are. You're a cunt. You are. You are. You're a cunt. Oh, I'm gonna. Look at the belly. You cunt. You cunt. Fucking cunt. You big, fucking cunt. They're just sounds. And finally, the air horn scene. The, the, the most annoying. So if you break this down in terms of characters, Matt clearly isn't happy. So instead of apologising, Tony just totally disregards his reaction in a really obnoxious way and selfish way. Tony, can you clear this up please? No! And I just can't understand what Ricky Gervais is going for here. Is, is this meant to be endearing? It's psychotic. Tony not only disrespects his friend in front of his entire work staff, but he totally undermines his authority. If, if he hadn't lost his wife and you didn't know about it, you didn't know about it yeah. he's just a fucking psychopath. It's still mental, whether you've lost someone or not. Just because you've suffered doesn't make you entitled to go around doing and saying whatever you like. Oh, you don't get it, man. He's grieving. Look, grief is an emotion that we've all experienced, or if not, we will do. It would be near impossible to live a life and never feel it. And I get that people grieve in different ways, but the way it's shown on this show is not healthy in the slightest. And it worries me that it's played out as if it is. Because Tony never faces repercussions for any of his actions. He is always excused by other characters that say stuff like, He's still in pain. I'm so sorry about that. He's still not well. And this program never seems to help you show how to deal with these issues in a sensible way. Oh, you're ill and suicidal? Well, don't go to therapy, kill a junkie, throw ashes in someone's face and humiliate someone. <sighs> I don't know, man. All in all, four really poorly put together scenes that, I mean, has to make you question if this guy's lost touch with reality, because to me, this is crazy. I think you better leave, because you're just bringing the whole vibe down. Okay, enough negativity. Let's talk about the parts I liked. Okay. Um, I, I, I did quite like the bit where Brian has to awkwardly push his shopping cart around Mickey the Gypsy and his ex-wife when they just didn't move after talking to him. Um, I quite like this line. You know what? Let's do it. Time for me to become a man. Will you help me break the news to my mum? And um, obviously I laughed at the children with cancer, but um, okay, that, that is it. Genuinely, I struggled to find anything in this season that I liked apart from those. Let's talk about the ending. Actually, because this might surprise some people. 
I I didn't mind it. I mean, not the salute or the cheesy montage beforehand or the forced way in which everyone partners off. I'm, I'm basically just talking about the final shot. At least it gave you something to think about. At least there was some form of interpretation needed rather than every scene previous which lacks all forms of subtlety. Although Ricky has done interviews and gone on Twitter to tell everyone the meaning taking away all interpretation but and, and also I, I don't understand why Lisa appears in the end scene. I think I would prefer it had the dog faded out and and then Tony did and, and, and I thought the music was again just too deliberately sad, a little too on the nose. Um, I actually did quite like that the nurse didn't partner up with Tony, just sort of showing you know that you shouldn't you shouldn't settle. But um, of course, there were obviously parts that I didn't like. As mentioned, I hated how everyone else partnered up despite there being no real reason. That the postman and calf, why? Brian and the new intern, why? You, you you can't have it both ways. You can't go the whole three seasons hammering home, making jokes about how disgusting and pathetic Brian is, and then pair him off with someone at the end just because it's convenient to do so. Why would she be interested in him? The postman didn't need to exist in this season, to be honest, as he, he does absolutely nothing. Ricky Gervais should have just wrote him out like he did with Roshi and Connerty's character. Um, I also hated the money angle introduced at the end where it's revealed Tony got a life insurance payout from Lisa but he doesn't want to cash it because because of what it represents. Then he eventually realises that it makes absolutely no sense not to cash the cheque because the only people winning in him not doing so is the insurance company. So he sort of goes around giving people money but, but doesn't this send out the complete wrong message? Is this not just saying, oh, oh, money will get rid of all your problems? It's it's just an empty gesture. Couldn't he, couldn't he have done something actually nice? You know, something something with thought that that can inspire people who don't have money. So, how would I rank the show as a whole? Uh, poorly. I I think the thing about it is. is I can't seem to get out of my head the fact that Ricky Gervais wrote this himself. So every time Tony wins an argument or gets complimented by another character, I can't help but think to myself, he wrote that about himself. I've, I've always had this thought uh, with Goodwill Hunting as well. You know, Matt Damon writes a script in which he's the smartest man in the world, and I just can't help but feel there's something oddly egotistical about it all. At least in that case though, the script was co-written so it doesn't feel as bad as Afterlife. And I'm certainly not saying that if you write something you can't star in it because, well, just look at Ricky's previous work. I mean, not Derek obviously because that, that was also shit, but look at The Office and Extras. In those shows the main characters are part of the jokes in most episodes, but you root for the character and at the end you get rewarded seeing the character do the right thing. But in Afterlife, in my opinion, Tony starts as a dislikable character, and he remains that throughout. I still think that Ricky needs someone to challenge him when he writes this, or someone to make suggestions for him, because I do still find Ricky Gervais funny when he isn't banging the beat to his own drum, and when he isn't making jokes about the same stuff. The constant bombardments of tweets telling him he's a genius on Twitter I really don't think has helped, and, and that's what I always see, and it still boggles my mind how wildly popular this show is, and I seem to always see positive feedback. I mean, Ricky does like and retweet every single compliment the show has ever received, um, but the most common things I see people say is genius and beautiful. Those are the two words I see most often. Can someone explain to me what exactly is genius and beautiful about minute-long scenes of Brian describing in excruciating detail the smell of his ex-wife's taint for the 100th time? What exactly is genius and beautiful about these forced emotional scenes that play sad music over the top of Tony crying? I certainly don't think the show is genius and beautiful. In fact, I, I think it's quite hollow, and I think it lacks depth. It, it feels like it was written by someone who hasn't quite managed to explain their emotions as, as eloquently as they would have liked. There's, there's no subtlety. And I, I, I'm not saying Ricky hasn't experienced grief, because obviously he has, who hasn't? But if I had made this, I think I would be frustrated as to how shallow some of my feelings and points come across. 
In fact, this show feels as if it was written by David Brent. Not by Ricky Gervais, but by David Brent. It's, it's as if it's an ironic parody of a bad TV show, except it isn't. Like it was made by someone so desperate to get respect from their peers, but they don't have the capacity or know-how to do so. I really got this impression when I saw the promotional music video that Ricky made with, with a bloke called Andy Burrows, who apparently is a songwriter, but if you listen to the lyrics, I mean, Jesus Christ, it's, it's about as basic as you can be. It opens up with, when I was young, I asked my dad why being poor didn't make him sad. He smiled and said to me, son, we're rich as hell. You'll understand when you meet your girl. Hell, girl, bit, bit of stretch, but you have to check it out though. It is an absolute treat. The song is, well, the song is pretty. I mean, it's appalling, and it is so similar to the music videos that Ricky used to make as David Brent. But obviously, when he made them as David Brent, it was a comedy, it was a parody. You know, it was a, it was a joke on the character. It was bad, but intentionally because you know the joke is that the character thinks this is good and thought-provoking but this isn't a character this is Ricky making this video without irony as if it was some sort of deep and emotional song oh and in this music video and this is extraordinary the lyrics relate to the show so there's the lyric he smiled and said to me son and it shows Tony with his dad there's the lyric and never count your money and it shows you know the odd looking bloke in in a Rolls Royce and, and whenever it says someone to love it shows Lisa right so so bear that in mind do you know what it shows for the lyrics if you want to go fast then go alone if you want to go fast then go alone any guesses you might you might be thinking Brian yeah no no I'll tell you it it shows this I'm not joking you, you can look this video up <laughs> On, it's on Ricky Gervais's YouTube channel and and oh and then the next lyrics are but if you want to go far go with someone and it's Tony and Lisa laughing and choking I mean what were they thinking is that why the child is dying of cancer did he not find a partner soon enough <laughs> Jesus Christ and I don't I don't think Netflix even knew what to do with this or if there was any involvement because I can't find this referenced by them at all and I mean it doesn't feature in the show and it's not part of any promotional material that they've done it's literally the only place I could find it was Ricky Gervais' YouTube channel and and speaking of Netflix I don't think they knew how to market this new series because in the trailer it's implied that this series is going to be like a road trip for Tony and Matt to sprinkle Tony's dad's ashes I've decided to go on a little trip to scatter my dad's ashes. Oh, that's sweet. My ashes? You're not my dad, remember? Am I adopted? Fuck me, it's like I've got a replacement. But then that period only takes up barely half an episode. But then again, what would you show? It's just, it's all the same stuff. You, you may as well just play the season two trailer again. And now that the show's finished, Netflix is sort of like clickbaiting the series with these bizarre compilation videos uh, I don't know but I, I don't know I think I just want to vent my frustration on this cringe <laughs> and I've called this show sort of um, hollow and, and shallow and obvious but I find it quite hard to explain what I mean by that so let me show you this as an example there is a YouTube channel called Darman which is the name of the person that owns the channel and he produces the worst short film well I mean that's what he calls them the worst short films I've ever seen that they they're appalling the acting is awful the scripts are absolutely horrendous the the dialogue they have the most the most obvious blatant message that you can basically determine from the title alone uh, l let me show you some examples so you, so you know what I'm talking about Hey Chris, is the delivery guy show up? Oh yeah, it's in the back. Oh great. Okay, what's going on here? I'm trying to place an order. Is there a problem? Yeah, there's a problem. You're the problem. Now go take your business somewhere else, because we don't serve your kind of people in here. My people? Just because I'm different doesn't mean I'm not equal. It is not okay how you treated them. 
What's wrong with them buying some cupcakes? They're for a bridal shower for a gay wedding. Whose side are you on, Kristen? Theirs. You really want to do this? There is nothing wrong with being gay, lesbian, trans, or any other part of the LGBTQIA plus community. I can't believe you would support that kind of behavior. I don't just support it. I'm part of the community. Kristen quits her job, nervous but also excited to start her baking business. Well, let me go and get the waste agreement and we'll get you going. What are you doing here? Hi, Trey. I suppose you came to beg for your old job back. <laughs> Hardly. Are you the one responsible for all those bad reviews I got and now know what'll come in my store? Trey, as much as you deserve those bad reviews, I wasn't the one behind them. Well, if it wasn't you, then who was it? We may have had something to do with that. Yeah, sorry, but not sorry. <laughs> they were just um, chilling around the corner, waiting for um, him, him to say those exact words, don't worry about it. Look, the, the point is, is that this is bad. Okay, you can see that, can't you? I was going to show you um, three of these videos in in total to to sort of show you sort of how bad they are, but I couldn't. I literally couldn't bear to watch another two. You you get the point. They're they're all like this. You can tell what happens from the title. And I have no problems with the message of this video. However, it is so poorly put together and done so brazenly that it is impossible for me to take it seriously. If you scroll down to the comments, you get hundreds upon hundreds of people who talk about how powerful this is and how much it moved them. The bad guy actor is really good. You should have him in more videos, da. Da man, I must say, as a person who fights online bullying, I admire your attempts at persuading people into treating others equally. Keep it up. These are really inspiring, da man. Thank you for making these. I love this lesson and I love how you change the lives every day and your crew works so hard on the first sane comment can we all agree that these videos never fail to disappoint us and this is how i see afterlife i see it as obvious shameless unfunny and and lacking quality on the most basic levels with an audience that for whatever reason can't seem to see any of the flaws that's why i had to make these videos talking about it I felt like Frank Grimes in the Simpsons episode when no one else could see what a buffoon Homer was. I mean, if, if you did like the show and made it this far in the video and will still continue to like it, then I mean go for it I guess, more power to you, but just understand where the people who, who didn't like it are coming from. Wow, okay, that was again way longer than I thought it was going to be. Thanks uh, for the, the views on the last couple of videos. Um, yeah, as I say, it's way more than I was ever expecting. So cheers for that and um, see you all later. Maybe you need to search your mind and try and find the slightest sense of humour, fella. Because honestly, you remind me of an old biddy from my very early teens back in the late 70s, early 80s, Mary Whitehouse. This woman would complain about nearly every single program that was on TV. Carry on films were referred to as bawdy, foul and abhorrent to society. Haha, <laughs> carry on films. And you do sound a bit like the sort of person she was. Maybe you're her great grandson, which by the sound of you wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Haha. <laughs> When you criticise something, you need to get your factual content exactly right too, or people like myself, with a sense of humour, and TV Hawkeye will spot your mistakes. You mentioned a scene in which you said the psychiatrist in it had played Derek's mate Kev in the comedy series of the same name. Uh, uh, X, our survey said. The psychiatrist is played by Paul K, not by David Earl or Kev from Derek, as you put it. I think you fail to realise what Afterlife is really about and why Ricky made it. I just, I cannot believe your shallowness of mind and how detached from the real world you seem to have become. Try and make happy blogs or progs on YouTube and try to see the world in a different way instead of complaining about things like, what does the guy who takes the pictures with him in the paper really do there? He's there as a person for Ricky's character to mainly take the piss out of because of his eating habits and inability to pull a bird. 
Andy Millman is an angry man who feels terribly cheated his wife died so young, but slowly and surely he begins to come to terms with this. Try and think and look deeper, and stop being so negative, mate, for fuck's sake. Ricky is actually a friend of mine. I know, I know, I can hear the voices. Yes, of course you are, but I really is. I... <laughs> I first met him when I was at uni in London and he was my mate's boss. Ricky was an entertainment manager at the University of London, SU, and my mate, who I should call Kev, <laughs> was his assistant. He left and went with Stephen Merchant to XFM and was there a fair while before he was sacked and replaced by Bob Geldof. If my memory serves me right, which we all said he should put on his CV. He is an extremely intelligent man and an extremely funny man who has the weirdest and most genuine laugh I've ever heard and he's not afraid to use it either. He is also the most genuinely honest and forthcoming person I've ever met too. Have you seen him at the Oscars awards? Making A-list celebrities like himself squirm till they have? Some of them got up and left but only because he's told the truth about them which is why Tom Hanks feckin hates him. I write comedy myself. Well. Uh, oh. I write comedy myself, we all, at least I try, and it's one of the most difficult jobs in entertainment because you will never, ever please everyone like yourself, a miserable, a, miser a miserable old polecat joke. Sorry I started off so harshly, but when you don't know the whole story of someone's comedy or actual life, then you have no right to criticise so much. If you don't like it as a comedy show, that's fair enough, but picking bits out like what does the guy who takes pictures even do at the paper? Well it's nothing to do with taking the photos much, it's to do with his personal life, and why on earth would that annoy you so much? The C word with Annette Crosby is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Imagine what she thought when she saw the script. But then as the old lady she played, it was about the miserable dull life she led with her husband until he died with no kids, no grandkids, and having lived in the same little village all her life, never been abroad, etc, etc. Ricky really cleverly uses everyday people's, everyday problems, and turns them into pure gut-busting laughter. You, by the sounds of it, are just listening to an old lady keep saying the C word and a large guy takes some photos. That's not what it is at all. It runs far deeper in all of his comedies, film and TV. Well. I've had my say, so hey my friend, have a think first before judging too much. <laughs> what? Take Gary Oldman's film, Nil by Mouth. Not his life story, but he says it is very much the life he did grow up in. He didn't even like beer but became an indoor alcoholic and not a nice one either, etc. Brought up on a rough estate, Deptford, East London. Now look at him, a Hollywood global megastar just like Ricky, an A-lister. Cheers, B.